Right now is the first time that we are seeing actual immortality being born where you can in fact train a model on a human. The only question we have as a species right now is can we actually survive this moment? Don't die is this new emergent philosophy. It really is trying to capture the broadest possible context of what it means to be intelligent in this part of the galaxy. You said it's false that you will die based on your biomarkers right now. When do you think your physical body can go to? I'm a professional rejuvenation athlete. I'm like an Olympian, but for longevity. That's tech millionaire Brian Johnson. He's on a one-man mission to reverse the age of his body and to try and live for as long as is humanly possible. To that end, he takes part in a very, very laborious daily regime. But is immortality really possible? And is it scientifically safe to experiment the way that Brian does? I was curious to find out more, so I caught up with Brian on Zoom and then spoke to an independent scientific expert to ask their opinion on this one-man longevity experiment. Can we start off by asking, what are you doing at the moment? What's on your head? What's it for? Yeah, I was just actually uh, finishing my morning routine. This is a uh, 10, 27 nanometer uh, red light that is used for all sorts of conditions for just basically cognitive health. There was a study that recently came out where they were uh, looking at ADHD in children and how uh, usage of this over four weeks improved. So there's clinical applications and there's general health applications for uh, brain wellness. So I've been doing this for... 10 minutes a day for the past two weeks. And then I measure my brain age with this kernel headset. This is um, what I built in my brain. Up and that's like a wearable fMRI. So then I measure my brain age looking at my uh, functional brain connectivity. So I measure to see whether these uh, treatments have any kind of measurable effect in my cognition. If you could just very quickly drill through what your morning routine is at the moment in its entirety, I'd really appreciate that. Yes, it's uh, now about six and a half hours. So I wake up around uh, four and a half to five, four thirty, five in the morning, and then I get, I measure my basal temperature, my waking body temperature. I get light in my eyes. I do uh, some hair serums for hair growth, a red light cap therapy. I'll then eat a breakfast, uh, a blueprint breakfast. I'll work out for an hour, cardio, strength, balance, a sauna for twenty minutes, two hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Then I'll do red light therapy for ten minutes, and then. I previously was doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'm now doing um, IHHT, this is hypoxia therapy, altitude training. So wow. yeah, I just go up and down in oxygen concentration and then I will have breakfast. And so the way to think about this is a lot of people hear this, they think that's crazy. And the way they can think about it is I'm a professional rejuvenation athlete. I'm like an Olympian, but for longevity. And so we, me we do measurements on a daily basis I'm the most measured person in history. We measure something every day, whether urine, saliva, stool, blood, imaging. Like we just take enormous amounts of data from my body. We look at through, we put it through an algorithm. We say, how does this compare to the scientific evidence? We look at my measurements and do it again and again. So it's like a, it's like a training ground for rejuvenation. You've um, mentioned that you have a team of 30 specialists on your team, right? Um, could you tell me what they work in? You know, do you have an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist? What kind of scientists and doctors are working with you? Yeah, we try to find people in every domain of expertise. And so yep, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, uh, methylation patterns, uh, you know, protein patterns. So we really seek out the best and just say, hey, we're acquiring this data. We're looking at this thing. What can you tell us about what you're learning? We're very playful. We're very experimental. We're willing to just kind of follow the data and the science. So yeah, we get a lot of people who are just willingly and excited to participate and they come from every area of science in anti-aging and longevity. You mentioned that you're happy to experiment. And of course, there are things where the existing evidence is pretty in its preliminary early stages. So take rapamycin, for example, which you stopped earlier this year. Do you ever have fears around experimenting with things where we don't have the solid science yet? How do you think about that? Yeah, I would flip that and say that a lot of people will look at this experiment and will say, Brian, but wait, you are uh, at so much risk. And I say, friend, you are at greater risk than I am because you're experimenting with fast food and staying up late and drinking alcohol and eating toxins. And so a lot of people don't realize that they, I think their lives are higher risk than my life, that I basically am taking fewer risks overall because I sleep well, because I eat well, because I exercise all the time. I spoke to Richard Shaw, Director of Aging Research at King's College London. 
He notes that certain biomarkers are indeed reversible or modifiable, things like cholesterol levels, lipid levels, even epigenetics. He's cautious, though, about attributing specific ages to these biomarkers. He says we just don't have robust enough data sets to be able to do that in a very comprehensive way, at least at the minute. He's glad that Johnson is willing to experiment with things that could well be deemed too risky or experimental for a clinical trial. And he's optimistic that perhaps Johnson could work with more mainstream scientists with the intention of fueling and informing future mainstream science. He obviously notes that the sample size of one isn't terribly helpful to extrapolate broad results from. What would you say to people who say, hey, you know, what I'm going to do is focus on, you know, going to festivals and staying up late and having fun with my friends? What, what would you be your reply to, to that? Everyone has their own their own choice. And uh, I think that it. It really is like this, this perspective where when when someone close to you dies and you attend their funeral, you get this sobriety of like, what is life about? What do you truly care about? And you know, compared to when you're in your daily uh, events where you just like, you go after the systems, like you go after the power status wealth that the world has given to you. And what I'm saying right now is we are in a funeral-like moment. We need that kind of sobriety. This is a really big deal. Now, maybe it's the case that our current, like maybe it's democracy and, Ch- and the Chinese um socialism system and capitalism can like sort this whole thing out. Maybe it's all going to be fine. But what I'm just calling, what I'm calling to attention is that maybe there's a new way to think about reality. And there's other, like, for example, in 1870, new ideas came about that there were these microscopic objects called bacteria that cause infection. At that time, that was insane. Like people said, like, if you believe in that garbage, you're not a gentleman, you can't practice medicine. So we know through our history that new ideas come about. They're insane for people who live in that time period, but they actually turn out to be true. And so what I'm saying right now is I think the, we really need to question the fundamentals of what we're going after for as a species, because those things could be the very things that endanger our lives. In a recent interview, Brian, you said it's false that you will die because, and I think this is right, you're uploading your thoughts to an AI, and that's how you could exist for this you know, unquantifiable amount of time. Do you think that it'll be the case that your flesh will die, but your personality will live on via AI? And based on your biomarkers right now, when do you think your physical body can go to? Humans have always imagined immortality through some way, shape, or form. I mean, most religions offer immortality as their prize, that that the reason why one would obey commandments is to achieve this prize, or whether it's reincarnation or some other kind of continuation of existence. And so uh, right now is the first time that we are seeing actual immortality being born, where you can, in fact, train a model on a human. Everything they've written, everything they've spoken, their gestures or mannerisms, and you can, in fact, create them through some resolution. Now, is it really them? You know, is it just the patterns of them? But still, it's like the first real representation of a continuation of somebody's being. When a loved one dies, you really could have models of that person in your life and engage with them as if you were, you know, interacting with them on a daily basis. Uh, as to my ex- life expectation. I'm so I'm 47 right now. I don't think my life expectancy matters because I think that the changes we're going to see with AI will be so dramatic and it will happen uh, much faster than my expected 40 to 50 year time span that I have left, that it's really not a relevant question. The more important question is, will the human race survive uh, giving birth to artificial general intelligence? Do, do the humans have a future, basically? Could you just draw out for me more, Brian, the link between don't die and AI? I don't quite understand. So how do these two things need to be in alignment for like the next phase? I mean, AI is the most significant thing happening in the world right now. Uh, and it's progressing very quickly. Now, people understand the context on this. They say, well, am I still going to have a job? Right? That's a very practical question. And then there's other questions like, how do we know uh, what is AI and what is human? Um, will AI eventually, will AI be a hiring manager? Will AI decide who gets loans and who doesn't? Will AI make decisions in the courts? So we have all these really practical questions about how AI plays a role. There's this bigger role, this bigger question in society, what do we use AI for? And right now in society, the biggest three goals of of the society is power, wealth, and status. That the majority of our efforts as humans is we try to go after those three things. And a lot of it is wealth. You know, we, capitalism really is 
the most powerful game in the world. And in this context, as we give, if we give birth to super intelligence, the question I'm trying to raise is, are those endpoints the right endpoints when we're giving birth to super intelligence? For example, if those endpoints invite us to go to war with each other or kill each other, and now we're using AI to go to war and to kill each other in ever more efficacious ways, are those good goals to have? And so what I'm calling into question is, those goals have been into place when death is inevitable. But when death is not inevitable, we say, hey, is it possible? Like, let's just broaden our imagination just for a second. Is it possible a new paradigm of thinking is here? And that paradigm is don't die, which means that we wouldn't do silly things with AI in pursuing power, status, and wealth. We wouldn't rush the development. We wouldn't use it in ways that harm other people. So I'm really trying to say that just like the U.S. created a new form of democracy, a new form of governance when breaking away from the British crown, uh, we know new ideas come into the world and they shape how we think about, uh, about how we do things. I'm saying that this moment is so big and such a disruption that there's a possibility we think wholesale how we think about reality and don't die, basically don't die right now, is the new way we understand the world. What I'm really trying to say above all is that uh, this is a very sober moment. We are giving birth to super intelligence on the time scale of years, potentially. It is more consequential than we can realize. And what I'm trying to say is that choosing life and choosing health is the same as building safe AI. I would love to know, Brian, what you think is like the next big thing in the longevity field. Is there anything that you're very excited about that we're not quite there yet, but is on the horizon? Yeah, I'm an investor in uh, the company New Limit, which is doing the reprogramming, uh, the Yamanaka factors, the transcriptin factors. So I think that uh, reprogramming of uh, making old cells young is a really promising path for rejuvenation. Uh, they're focusing on specific things like liver, liver cells and T cells. So I, I think that uh, probably significant uh, breakthroughs in longevity are, you know, are still out. I don't think anything is imminent. And so I, I would say that the misconception around this project is I do believe that AI will eventually offer substantial uh, improvements in the way we actually um, try to slow down our speed of aging and reverse aging damage. I asked Xiao about this approach, and he said that while epigenetics is a really interesting area of research, one we desperately need to better understand, reprogramming is currently in its infancy and does carry potential risks. What are the top things you would recommend to our readers? Lower your resting heart rate before bed. That is the number one thing I have learned through my years of effort. I've, I've become the most measured person in the world, I guess, in history. And your resting heart rate before bed determines how well you're going to sleep and how well you sleep determines if you will exercise and if you exercise will determine if you eat well. And so it begins this really positive cascade. And what you'll learn by focusing on your resting heart rate is that anything that increases your heart rate before bed is bad for you. And things that lower your heart rate before bed is good for you. Basically the, the challenge that I think people have is they want to be healthy, but they find it to be very challenging. Uh, you know, it's, you're late at night, you're stressed, you haven't eaten in a long time, take out, you want to sit down on the couch, watch your favorite show, eat your food. Uh, so totally understandable. The problem is if you eat that uh, food and you know an hour before bed, it's going to make your body feel full. You have to do all the digestion and then your body has to work very hard to digest food, which means it can't allocate its resources to sleep. And then you have less quality sleep. You wake up in the morning, not feeling great. You're like, I don't feel great today, so I'm not going to exercise. So that's why resting heart rate really captures someone's entire life. And I like to say that because if I say something like focus on sleep and exercise and diet, people will be like, great. And they do it for a day and like too much. <laughs> so I like to really simplify it into something that is free, accessible, and easy to understand that basically applies to everybody every day and helps incorporate. So like, for example, I'll say like five habits to lower your heart rate. One is to eat four hours before bed. So if your bedtime's at 10, finish eating all your food by 6 p.m. Have screens off 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime. So if your bedtime's at 10, your screens are off 9.30 to 9. So that gives you an hour, so number three, to wind down. So your body needs about an hour to just calm itself down from the day, stress and worry. So take that hour to read a book, go for a walk, talk to a friend, take a bath, meditate, breath work but you really need to calm down. You can't just scroll and then put your head in the pillow and expect to go to sleep. It doesn't work that way. 
to be mindful of stimulants because late coffee, late caffeine can raise your heart rate. And then five, the biggest one is rumination. So of all the things that increase heart rate, rumination can increase the heart rate between five and 25 beats per minute. So this is things you're mad about, worried about, obsessed about. So that rumination really is tough on the resting heart rate. So I try to help people establish really good habits to say, this is how life is, is run. And then doing that, health becomes much more manageable. Thank you so much, Brian. Really, really appreciate your time. It was interesting to speak with Brian and learn more about his hyper experimental and sometimes risky approach to trying to live as long as he possibly can. Like Brian himself says, though, sometimes the more banal advice is actually the most effective. So like he says, lowering your heart, resting heart rate before bed, but also eating a varied diet, maximizing your social connection, getting enough sleep and moving your body.